you would want to know how is your system working out again you have to think from a different sector and bring in all those learnings in here so we decided okay we need to show the homeowner how is your system performing on a real time basis how do you do that you need iot and you need an app which shows them that so we created a one iot device it needed to be completely inexpensive again in a us or in australia people are ready to pay like say 300 dollars 400 dollars just to monitor their system's performance in india if you are buying the system for let's say 2500 dollars you are not really looking to pay another 10% of the cost just to monitor the system's performance so what we did was we went we checked all kind of sensors and chips and created a device which was so inexpensive that we started giving it out for free along with systems and that is this just to take out all the concerns that people have in their mind that iot device connects to the app sends data over cloud so very happy to see the fraternity once again uh, just in the best interest of time i will begin uh, it's a big privilege and a pleasure to reconnect with everyone our distinguished panelists who are hand picked because of the think input and the rich experience that they bring in i thank you to our distinguished audience for joining us we have received 150 registrations most of whom are senior leaders ceo cxos uh, many of them are our members and our repeat visitors to our webinars very encouraging and motivates us to provide even higher levels of dialogue on the online channels as well uh, for those of you who are new with us today the blue circle is an exclusive community and ecosystem which is curated for business leaders across six sectors which are energy e mobility real estate logistics healthcare and aerospace and defense we also present socio economic insights which ultimately determine the evolving complexion of the market and now in response to the covid challenge the blue circle has accentuated its digital presence one of the many modes we employ is our weekly webinar in our digital publication and in in addition to this and you'll be happy to know that we very recently launched the first version of the blue circle app for leaders somewhat like the sector specific linkedin for leaders a space that brings you all together uh, to connect with each other to house high quality curated content and to also provide access to business opportunities across these sectors uh, in fact we've just released uh, a new update today with a very exciting feature which will just be going live shortly and um, so for those leaders who are interested please do join us i will also share the link to the app in the chat section and we'll be soon sending invitations to our new guests for the webinar uh, we've also begun our selective outreach for memberships and i've close to 3000 leaders who've joined the waitlist uh, now with our new version live we will be uh, inviting uh, uh, select leaders from tomorrow onwards so uh, thank you very much and uh, today as part of our innovation series we're privileged to have big minds and leading thinkers of the industry to join in for the energy communities discussion uh the topic is viable innovation domains in renewable energy and now in the best interest of time i will just briefly mention the names and designations of our panelists who've joined us we have with us mr pranesh choudhury founder and ceo zandru mr pinaki bhattacharya md and ceo amp energy india mr derek jose co-founder and cpo pura and the chair and moderator for the session is mr pavan choudhury who is also a board member and an investor in the blue circle uh, chairman medical technology association of india ceo of french mnc wygon india public intellectual best selling author and is a leading thinker in energy e mobility and across sectors uh, i i now request mr choudhury to please chair and moderate the session thank you sadat and hello everybody so renewable energy technologies have made dramatic technical economic and operational advances over time technologies like wind solar have not only become economically viable but also environmentally preferable to fossil fuels and these technologies innovate at different levels in the energy matrix whether it is energy production transmission or consumption therefore to look at renewable energies and innovation innovations in renewable energy we thought of 
looking at it from a prism which has four sections. First is the product stroke technology innovations. So in wind, solar, ocean, geothermal, what are the most viable technologies which are emerging? The second lens to look at this is enabling technology innovations. So artificial intelligence, IoT, blockchain are enabling technologies which are really uh, expediting innovation in this area and adoption and consumption of renewable energy. In this area of enabling technology, you also have storage. The third area of innovations is business model innovation. And the fourth area is financial model or market design innovation. For example, you have the Invit scheme and you have several other interventions made by non-business players which alter the market and innovate towards greater uh, use of renewables. So these are the four sections or the four focal lengths through which we can study innovation in this space. Pinaki operates in each of these sections. So let me ask him to tell you more about these sections through some examples, how product and technology innovations are moving ahead, which are the most viable product and technologies uh, which are innovating today. How are the enabling tech innovations pairing and how are business models and financial models or market designs changing? Pinaki. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that introduction and sort of setting the stage for this thing. And uh, it was very nicely described in terms of the four dimensions uh, that we can bucket these innovations. So it just gives a structured way of thinking. Otherwise, the word innovation can mean a lot of things. So I'll just briefly talk about the four dimensions. Uh, so the first dimension is the financial innovation and as well as the market design innovation. So which is basically uh, in the financial domain, why innovation is needed for renewables especially because it's a very capital intensive industry because most of the cost is spent uh, upfront because you literally don't have too much of running cost there. And as you see in most of the headlines, uh, companies after companies keep on raising massive amount of capital uh, to keep building these assets. Uh, the, the issue becomes is that uh, in normally in uh, other, other industries, you reach a steady state situation where you have to stop raising more and more capital from equity investors and sort of you become sustainable. But somehow uh, in renewables, the way uh, the, uh, there are two aspects. Once it is very expensive, the second is the gestation time is short. So you need a lot of capital in a very short time. And by the time you deploy the capital, the problem is that the cap, uh, it doesn't throw up a lot of free cash flow to equity because a lot of it goes into the debt service and all. So you perennially have a, uh, like a, a gap in the holding company. So this is the problem essentially that, uh, that needed a financial innovation. So one of the innovations that has uh, been done, uh, again, thanks to the government, because it's also in a way a market design as well as a financial innovation is by incorporating the Invit model, the Infrastructure Investment Trusts. Now, which are basically a model wherein long-term investors like pension funds and sovereign wealth funds can get access to long-term contracted cash flows, which have very low operating risks. So earlier it was basically the domain of transmission assets. And now uh, renewable assets because uh, they're long-term contracted and the operating risk is low because the sun and the wind is literally free. So uh, that is the structure that the government has designed and through which as a company, one can free up the capital. So one, let's assume a gigawatt platform we create, get it to operations. Now there is an equity and the debt component that goes into creating this platform. Then the uh, capital of that platform, the equity capital is released by flipping it to the infrastructure investment trust, where there is a different set of investors who have a slightly lower risk appetite and a lower return requirement. So as a result, what happens is that the, uh, the company and its investors 
they get a boost in their returns because they take the developmental risk which is that is higher risk capital so higher return and the capital is speed redeploy into new assets so it becomes what you have read in maybe in like um, in uh, in mechanical engineering the pm per perpetual motion machine so it is just becomes a self sustainable machine so this innovation what it will do is that it will lead to a situation that you have to stop this perennial fundraising and it can just it just becomes a self sustainable model so and and essentially both the sets of investors get what they want essentially the early stage investor gets higher return and they need an exit and the late stage investors they need to hold on to the assets long term de risk and they get moderate returns so that is something that is a brilliant innovation and uh, which will actually change a lot of things going forward in the how the renewable companies operate that's one the second uh, innovation i would say as far as the business model innovation bucket is um uh, is something called the virtual partner model i'll talk tell, tell you what briefly the problem is first because every innovation is hopefully to sol solve a problem so the problem was that basically a lot of commercial industrial customers they have to meet their 100% green objectives and at the same time save electricity now uh, you can do it by on site uh, renewable assets or you can do with open access within the state or outside the state but uh, there is a finite limit be uh, beyond which you cannot replace it by renewable power okay you get 50 60 70% so like on 30% or 40% still remains unaddressed which was not being replaced and for that many of these companies had to buy renewable energy credits uh, in international markets because they wanted to go 100% green and at the same time uh, the other problem is that when you do open access uh, obviously the discom consumption reduces little bit so in certain states discoms have been creating certain problems in certain states they have been very progressive so uh, so we, and, and 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 as, as a company we had these customers who had large power requirements and you basically cannot fulfill them because of the structure so the business model that is needed here is the virtual power plant model so what it does is that let's assume that we have a customer in maharashtra let's say data center customer and they have a large requirement but uh, they say that we will just comply by buying green energy credits i do not want the real electrons to flow into my system so what we do let's say we set up a large power plant in a state like rajasthan which is the lowest generation cost connect it to the cpu system and sell the power into the exchange and when we sell them the power in the exchange uh, it is a variable price that 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 we get so then the project is not financeable so what we do is that then the customer who is interested in the renewable energy credits they essentially backstop the price that we discover in the exchange the cash for difference contract so if we discover less than the price they pay the difference if we get more than the price then that is a sits as a positive account so with that small step essentially the project becomes bankable uh then the then what happens then the, the, sorry yeah. then the sorry uh, go go ahead after that uh, i request you to come on the product or uh, technology of renewables and then for enabling technology i'll go to the other panelists yeah. go ahead pinaki sure uh so yeah in fact they are much more suited for the enabling technology than myself so 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 in this case the virtual power plant what it does so uh you get a power plant which is technically a merchant power plant but because the price is backstop by a very credit worthy customer you get it project financed now the customer at the end of the day gets the renewable energy credits by paying the difference which can be even zero if you price it properly so they have a win win solution that they have a long term supply of renewable energy credits at a very affordable price we have a power plant which is bankable and the government side the discom actually doesn't lose the customer so it's a win win solution and there are certain regulations uh, that need to be slightly changed so this can be a good innovation third last thing i'll just talk about is the product innovation so on the product innovation the holy grail essentially when we started this i have been in the renewable sector for almost 15 years now so the uh, uh, the basically the holy grail was dispatchable green energy okay and that's the focus of our company on also we have to get into dispatchable green energy for cni and utility customers so the main innovation that is happening is what is happening basically towards that innovation is that uh, the solar plus the wind and the storage all the three getting combined to create almost uh, power plants with a plf of nearly 75% 80% which is possible today 
and that is the main innovation that is happening so we have already gone into hybrid now and both the customers really love the hybrid power that is solar and wind hybrid and then adding storage onto it and there uh, it is it is a race towards getting the cost right as well as the storage is concerned and within a year or two i see that renewable assets with this combination get into almost as a plf of a normal thermal plant and since you reach that point essentially uh, that was the only thing that was an issue in renewables i would say that gets solved essentially and once that gets solved then there is nothing stopping so that is the biggest innovation and there are definitely various technologies that my co panelists can talk which can lead us to that direction there and one small thing i just wanted to mention is the grid stability that is being caused instability that is caused till we reach that holy grail of very high uh, sort of plf and stable renewable power is basically there are innovations that are happening to improve the stability of the grid so for example uh, we have a product called smart transformers ampex which is basically replacing the distribution transformers by uh, simultaneously changing the voltage and the power factor so what you hear is that most of the sometimes the renewable as if there is too much of generation the grid kind of comes down the voltage regulation backs down the assets and all that will go up so there is some innovation happening on the grid side also till we get to a situation of dispatchable clean power so i'll just stop here and let my co panelists add into all these things it was a very very good opening and uh, you have uh, uh, very broadly covered uh, all the three points um and the uh, point which i uh, really which really took uh, drew my attention was the in uh, the invit fund and uh, this has been a long uh, standing problem of renewable technology that the advantages of the technology not only come to the business but go to the society also mm -hmm. which is why the investor who can once in a while invest that huge sum also hesitates because he will not be only the person who will be getting the return on investment and many a time he understands that his investments advantage will spill over to the competitor also mm -hmm. which is why also he hesitates in putting all his money there and uh, you have uh, uh, given the example of invit fund which are like uh, you know loosely speaking a mutual fund for large infrastructure investment great point pinaki let me come to pranesh and ask him pranesh in the life life cycle of the consumer of renewable power what are the innovations you feel are touching him and making him ad uh, adopt power consume power and benefit from the Uh, renewable energy advantages uh, pranesh sure thank thanks mr pavan choudhary for having me first of all and uh, yeah that's a great uh, way to start talking about the sector that i am working on right like how do you ensure that all these great solar panels and inverter that have been made by the bigger firms uh, how do they actually get distributed how do you ensure that the actual homeowner starts using it and that is where when we started uh, thinking of the entire life cycle we think that every every home every person that wants to go solar has three stages the first one is when they are still deciding uh, to go for solar and they need to design the system in the right way and that design includes basic things like what kind of solar panels do they need uh, what system size do they require as well as it has things which probably do not uh, fall up come to you immediately right for example people might be worried about how the facade of their roof will look post installation so all these things come into mind people are worried that uh, what kind of batteries will i need are there batteries what is the net meter versus a not off grid system or, and on then you hear all these prices being quoted in the solar auction which a homeowner think that okay now i should get my solar at 2.44 rupees which is now the lowest priced quoted right so all these this information is flying around all the time and then once this uh, this design part of the acquisition part of the homeowner is con converted then once they are getting the system delivered right how do you manage because there are multiple people who are uh, part of this now somebody is delivering the solar panels somebody is putting the wires in there so how do you ensure that the homeowner is always in confident that the right thing is happening the right way is happening that is where a lot of business innovation right partnerships will come into play which i'll talk about and but the biggest part of this customer's life cycle is once the system has been installed as a company you and or i uh, you are or i might think that acquiring the homeowner and getting them to pay and delivering the system we've done the big biggest part 
But from a homeowner's perspective, that's the day zero, right? They are now for the next 25 years, they are going to own that system, which has to produce the output that they bought it for. So on all these three, the only way for us to uh, solve this was through innovating at every step because there was no uh, playbook that we could follow. Nobody had done solar for homes in India. The way it was being done in US or Australia was usually on the rental model, which is a very different play where what, what Pinaki was mentioning, right? Like people owning the asset and then investing their own money. That's a very different play to have. What we needed to have was a very design first, very retail focused, consumer first approach. So the first step that we did was that first we needed to figure out our communication. You Usually what happens if you are a homeowner and you're looking for a solar panel and if you search for it, or if you talk to somebody in a solar company, they'll ask you what solar kilowatt do you require? Not everybody's an engineer in the country, despite what the stereotypes for our country are, not everybody's an engineer. They will not know what system size should they need. Uh, also, there could be people, there, there is always this that solar is about going green. While all those big words sound good, but at the end of the day, people are worried about how much, how, what is the ROI on it? Uh, how, how will I make my money return to me? So that is where, and we have tested this out. We went in a very scientific approach. We tested make money from sun and go green as the two logos, right? To the two buzzwords that we use. And we saw that make money from sun got us at least 70 X more returns that than go green did a very small change, but you rather than asking people what kilowatt is that they require, ask them what their summer electricity bill was. That is all people will re remember because that is the bias in their head that they remember the biggest electricity bill. Oh, last month I paid 5,000 rupees or last month I paid 3,000 rupees. That is what they will remember. They don't know the kilowatt is, they don't know the sanctioned load. All they care about is how can I make money from sun? Because everybody is talking about solar. Everybody's talking about these solar panels, which you can put on my empty rooftop. So that's the first aspect you come in, innovate the language that you are talking to the homeowner in. It should be the language that they understand. It. Then you ask them the question that they will know the answer that how much is your electricity bill in last summer? They'll remember that answer. Basis that you create a calculator, which immediately tells them, okay, you need to go for this system size. Then people will have concerns about the facade of the roof or what kind of color will the wires be used? That is where we use virtual reality to make the homeowner see how the roof will look post-installation. It's like when you go to a Mintra or a lens card to buy a dress or a specs for you, they put it on different, uh, they take your faces uh, estimations or dresses estimation and then show how you will look. Why can't you do the same for solar? This is a re re purchase, which is average is like four kilowatt that people are going for if you have one AC in your house. They're spending 1.752 lakh rupees. It's like buying a small car in your house. So you are, of course, going to want to know how will it look post-installation. So we show that in the app itself. You can choose different options. It will show how will the roof look. Again, virtual reality, you might not think that why, why does a solar panel system require it? Because the homeowner requires it. So you have to innovate. You have to bring that in the app. Then the delivery piece starts where it was all about business innovation, partnering. We needed to be asset light. We, could, we did not want to uh, start big warehouses across the country and uh, start buying panels and then install them four months down the line. We did not want engineers that we had hired to convince the homeowners to be the ones installing the system. So that is where we started with a supply control marketplace model, which allowed us to partner with the Tatas and the Adanis and the Vikrams to get the solar panels. because so they are doing a fabulous job of manufacturing the panel. Somebody else is doing the fabulous job of making the inverters. It's the end homeowner who is just not getting all these things integrated in the right way. So we'll do all that. All the products will get delivered there. And then a local installer will go and install as per the design that the homeowner approved on day zero. Once that was done, then comes the next 25 years. How does a homeowner now get to know how is the system performing? So when you invest in a stock, for example, let's say you buy a Reliance stock and you will go on a zero dollar share Khan to see how the stock is working out. Similarly, on the solar panels as a homeowner, you would want to know how is your system working out. Again, you have to think from a different sector and bring in all those learnings in here. So we decided, okay, we need to show the homeowner how is the system performing on a real-time basis. How do you do that? You need IoT and you need an app which shows them that. So we created a, one IoT device. It needed to be completely inexpensive. Again, in the US or in Australia, people are ready to pay like say $300, $400 just to monitor their system's performance. In India, if you are buying the system for let's say $2,500, you're not really looking to pay another 10% of the cost just to monitor the system's performance. So what we did was we went, we checked all kinds of sensors and chips and created a device which was so inexpensive that we started giving it out for free along with systems. And that is just to take out all the concerns that people have in their mind. That IoT device connects to the app, 
sends data over cloud and now homeowner can go and see that okay today is a cloudy day my system is performing this way how is mr pinaki's system performing or how is derek's system performing in bangalore so and then you send them again the communication learning that we had from day 0 we kept using that in the communication on this days as well so if it's a cloudy day you would want to know the relative performance of your system not just an absolute performance so you send them alerts like that how do you ensure that the systems get maintained over the next 25 years you send them maintenance alerts you will forget after a point of time that your solar panels were there on the rooftop they, they are not like your car they do not need a lot of maintenance you might forget to clean them and then dust and pollution which is the reality of our country will reduce your output so we send we send, we nudge them that you can get it uh, clean and one selfish way it helps us is that if a homeowner has any concerns that the inverter is not working or the panels are not performing we can remotely check which is a great thing about iot products right they can they allow you to remotely diagnose if there is anything wrong with wrong with the system so that is the product innovation which has in, helped us get bring it to as many homes as possible uh, very early days i think the the surface has not been scratched as pinaki was mentioning about the bigger systems right the uh, utility scale systems or the industry scale systems i think that's a lot of competition it's a lot of finance which is helping that sector evolve my sector the sector that we are trying to create i think it's like not even 100000 homes have gone solar in india and we have at least 20 million homes that could go solar so that's what what we are trying to uh, get into so in fact you can count 100001 very soon because <laughs> once you told me what was my electricity bill last year highest i was just thinking it's a very huge number you yeah. know so uh, so but the beautiful point you brought in you have said that khushboon ko phailne ka shauk hai magar mumkin nahi hawaon se rishta kiye bagar basically the innovation global energy which you have will not fly till you communicate in an innovative manner if you will communicate in an arcane insensitive manner it will not fly and not only have you communicated so beautifully you have brought in the contrast that you went through the go green kind of appeal an altruistic appeal and they did not go green but when you said that make money from the sun 70 times more people responded to you yeah. and with the indian mindset you know you also start feeling that if surya devta is working for you then you must be really <laughs> some so you are also you also feel blessed <laughs> now i am making money through surya devta that's wonderful and uh, the other point which you brought in was that you provided various metrics through which they could measure their performance as well as bring in at the right time the maintenance etc so that the overall experience of this innovative technology has become uh, not only uh, the consumer has become not only more receptive to it but also happier through it he is more pleased with the performance great points uh, pranesh and let me come on that note to derek and ask him the fourth bucket the first three buckets which pinaki spoke of were the market design bucket the business model bucket and the product bucket now we would like to know about the fourth bucket which is the enabling technologies bucket where you have iot ai big data and you have these enabling technologies which add huge power to the adoption of uh, renewable energy uh, through their innovativeness what are the innovations in these spaces which are pushing this agenda forward derek uh, thank you pawan and uh, good evening to all of you from cloudy bangalore uh, so i just wanted to touch upon uh, three innovation levers uh, i iot uh, ai and behavior design as enablers and illustrate those with uh, two stories uh, which we had i mean based on actual uh, examples we have executed uh, so the first was the case of uh, dutch based solar oem and the problem they were trying to 
Saul was uh, in the African market, uh, the hospitals, specifically the hospitals. Uh, a lot of them had high power issues. Uh, they had issues where people were dying on the operating table because of the power issue that. So they were trying to take a lot of these solar powered hospitals. Uh, and the problem they were trying to solve was uh, essentially continuously track two things. One is the health of the assets itself, solar powered assets, uh, predict failures of them, and essentially uh, uh, make sure that the spare parts are available on time. So basically do some kind of demand forecast based on the health of the assets. So the way we went about doing this was we collected all those uh, data from essentially power fluctuation data, the quality of power data. We also collected solar irradiance, put it into a solar 360. And the holy grail at the end of the day was take them on a journey. At the end of the day, they were self-cleaning equipments as well as autonomous operations, so to speak. But it's a journey. While it's the golden yards, it's a journey. The first step of the journey comes from building a, a solar Day, like where everything about the solar panel and continuous behavior was tracked uh, using data. The second step was uh, basically doing some anomaly detection to find out which areas need intervention and using those anomalies to predict future behavior of the process. So that was the first uh, example of this. And, and innovative, uh, innovation out here was that it was also, they were tracking uh, if there was any abuse to that equipment. You have a lot of the sensors which are watching what is happening to the equipment itself. So that is one aspect of it. The second was uh, for a uh, manufacturer in uh, California, basically, the builder project, which was uh, for about 12 months. Uh, they were trying to solve two problems. So the uh, innovation we applied was essentially uh, what I would call design for altering energy consumption habits of the customer. So there are two problems they're trying to solve. They're trying to get more people to become prosumers, essentially consume and produce and contribute back to the grid. So they wanted a prosumer model. Uh, the second is they wanted to target the guzzlers. They wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, the guzzlers are more sensitized towards the area. Uh, so we used <clears throat> simple techniques. So there are about 17 design patterns which are there to alter consumer behavior. But I'll give you an example of one simple was showed them the average bill in that zip code and benchmark their behavior with respect to uh, the average behavior in that neighborhood. So in that bill, it would appear very, very prominently. And at least that caused an increased sensitivity to their behavior so that they would alter the energy consumption habits. So I, I think a combination of AI, uh, IoT, and behavior design, if, if blended together very gracefully, has the ability to significantly change the way uh, uh, energy is consumed and produced back into those scripts. Uh, I, I'll pause with that. No, no, great point. In fact, your anomaly de detection and abuse point, I was relating with what Pranesh said, that he will, if I become his consumer, he will be telling me that how well is my solar panel functioning versus how well is my neighbor's uh, uh, solar panel <laughs> functioning. So if my panel is functioning lesser, I will surely quickly look for any mal, uh, malpractice or any abuse which has been made of by parent. But that's, that's, on a, that, that's on a lighter note. But uh, even you, solar cleaning you, uh, robots, uh, solar cleaning robots also sometimes end up damaging the panel. So uh, this is a very good uh, IoT based uh, design you spoke of. And uh, I was also reminded of a similar IoT based study, which said that why energy efficient appliances are not bought by consumers or they are not used. Maybe because of rush purchases, uh, where suddenly the appliance breaks down and even if they are aware, they just go and buy whatever they get. And most importantly, they said that builders and landlords who are not going to pay for utility bills uh, are do not have a strong incentive to invest in any green green premium device which will save uh, energy or uh, things like that. So great points, uh, Derek. And let me come back to Pinaki. Pinaki, you wanted to make some point. Go ahead. Uh, because I mean, uh, very interesting insights that Pranesh and Derek uh, brought in, because, and that has a sort of a cascading impact on the industrial space. Because at the end of the day, uh, when we sensitize 
uh, actual people in terms of like making money from the sun or essentially looking at each other's bills uh, and see how we can save energy and all these same people are actually working in corporations also okay and when they pick, take this thought forward because i we were to use the same kind of behavior we the government utilities or large commercial industrial customers like large corporations they are also clearly driven by actually economics definitely green is there but definitely they are economic driven and things like this actually sensitize them more for example if a ceo of a pharma company is somebody who is now sold a rooftop solar system now he suddenly embraces this then he will go and ask the people in his team that why don't we use it in the company so yeah. these things have a cascading effect and the other way around also when we approach a customer and tell them that okay and i have got this uh, like request we go to a large commercial industrial company and give them power then the individual people suddenly have the requirements who have individual system so it just the, the idea has to be disseminated and uh, in, as long as it in india it means economic sense it in itself and and these are actually interconnected things no no great 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 point and uh, what what is what is your what is your view on some of the technologies on which there are a lot of questions coming up mm-hmm. like the hydrogen technology and i will uh, later on if i get the chance i will name all the leading experts or good thinkers who we have the uh, good fortune of having on our webinars who are asking these questions but what is your take on hydrogen as one of the renewable technologies uh, whether it's viable uh, this innovation is viable coming uh, in the coming time so see uh, you do need to take a step back why suddenly people started talking about talking about green hydrogen or other things and all and uh, see basically uh, there is renewable energy you can use the renewable energy to convert it into power and use that power okay but uh, second thing is that you can use the renewable energy to store it and use it later on through a battery system but still there is tremendous amount of renewable energy that cannot be converted into power and used in, then and there itself in an economically viable manner so then the comes the question is that how can we technically convert let's say the renewable energy let's imagine the solar energy primarily or let's say wind energy we convert that and we use that energy essentially to create hydrogen okay now through electrolyzers so indirectly what you are doing is basically using you are actually indirectly storing the renewable energy there itself because you are using it because energy it is to be used when you generate or you store but this is a third way you put that energy into creating a hydrogen which we call as green hydrogen and then that can be transported all across uh, wherever it is needed to convert that into let's say energy again so that is what uh, the entire thing started off as we, we call it as uh, there are funds also getting created we call it power to x essentially uh, renewable energy subset as power what we are in this domain working on discussing on and the domain which is not in power is things like green hydrogen where you are actually using that to create uh, other fuels that can be transported even it will go into biofuels also by the way biofuels in a way is also like that only so uh, so that's a very interesting thing and especially given the fact that uh, hydrogen is a very clean fuel essentially second is that we are not blessed with a lot of gas uh, like natural gas and other resources like oil and gas in india but we are really blessed with a lot of renewable energy so this is a novel way where we utilize our own natural resources that we are blessed with to create something which we are not blessed with that is let's say gas okay and uh, so that's why there have been the government is uh, sort of having a draft uh, national hydrogen mission already in place and they will be just coming out with the final like industry interaction is going on and uh, that will just take off so i think so the target is to get almost million uh, tons of hydrogen by 2030 and uh, it is just a matter of uh, doing it at the right cost so as and when that process happens the scale takes up for example reliance just now and now they are also going to and there is a pli scheme that is in, uh, that is there for electrolyzers and all and lot of companies like uh, us who are in the primary renewable power domain although we are called lamp energy but we are basically in the renewable power domain see this as an adjacent opportunity because we, they will need the renewable energy to power the electrolyzer so it's, it's an adjacent opportunity and 
sponsors can be a really really very important thing as well as india as concerned for our growth in forward absolutely in fact what power to gas or gas to power uh, is a very important domain which is emerging i think the number one point which uh, hydrogen right now encounters the biggest obstacle is the cost piece yes. and uh, which as you have alluded to uh, uh, and the other speakers have also spoken about this or alluded to it that what seems insurmountable as a cost barrier today within a few years it just falls on the wayside 15 years ago we never thought that uh, solar and wind uh, per unit uh, cost would come down to so uh, so low and yeah. it is there and the same is for lithium ion batteries so great points binaki coming back to pranesh lithium ion, is, uh, lithium -ion so, still has a way to go lithium ion i mean uh, that is the one side that i think so we need slightly more support for the government to sort of bring down the cost uh on lithium ion uh, the battery part the solar and wind is fine but the third part needs some push yeah yeah and which is where market transformation practices are important because uh, as all all the speakers have said and some questions are also coming on that uh, on my whatsapp as well like a simple military uh, change can create a lot of uh, usefulness for uh, storage for example the time of the day tariff this is a regulatory change that because that was one of innovation there is a lot of regulatory innovation that is also happening in the sector today there is a new electricity amendment act that is going to come up so things like if you have a stronger price uh, time of the day tariff so that it is it becomes more viable for somebody to buy stored renewable power during the peak hours in which the discom is actually buying expensive power from somewhere else is a win win solution so that's a regulatory design if that changes that can open up more storage being required by the customers than actually trying to just do manufacturing so there's a smart way of doing it essentially yes and that is also kind of in in, in another stream of pulling in electric vehicles where you will charge your electric vehicle when when the power tariff is low and then you will move that electricity from the battery to for for household consumption when the power tariff is high or during peak power times right. and all those adjacencies as you spoke of are really coming alive yes coming coming to pranesh pranesh mm -hmm. yeah you spoke very beautifully about the uh, innovations which were made by you to make the consumer adopt renewable energy which is solar what about the financial experiments which you did for example some people perhaps with uh, limited experience say that emi etc works very well in this space does it and what are the innovations uh, uh, which are there which really do okay so okay so this has been a this has been a question that we have been asked in Lost right. you, Pranisha. Ah, go ahead. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Can go ahead again, I, please. So I was saying that this has been a question which I have answered to every uh, VC investor or uh, financial investor or a journalist that I've met in the last five years, right? And this, we we had to grapple with this. That do we start with the solar city model, where we put the solar panels on the rooftop and charge our rent? Does the finance make sense? Does the economics make sense? And we realize it it doesn't when you include the collections cost and everything uh, of putting the solar panels in like three kilowatt, five kilowatt systems. we never went that route but we knew and just like if you have to theorize you will always think that giving out a loan for this would make sense so we started trying out small experiments in bangalore and delhi and cr both uh, on emi schemes where we tried out give, partnering with a couple of bigger uh, financing solution providers uh, with they can give you an emi card or we said that okay you pay with any credit card that you have it could be an hdfc or a city bank or whatever you pay with that and we'll give you some discount on the interest that you are being charged and the theory was the hype or the null hypothesis was that this will lead to an increase in the conversion rate which was rejected by the customers wholeheartedly <laughs> no no lift was uh, seen at all and there then we had to now uh, create another hypothesis to ex explain to ourselves why did it not work you would imagine that if a 1.75 lakh purchase comes in why would people not really uh, opt for a emi scheme so there are two things one is that uh, 
the early adopters, these are all early adopters, the 100,000 people that have gone for solar right now in India, right? Uh, they all own their rooftops. So first is they are all homeowners. Second is before buying a solar, they would have bought a car as well, right? In India, you once you have a home, you buy a car as well. So now these are people by definition who are well-off people, who have a home, who have a car, who are now going for a solar rooftop system. So while from, from a very financial investor perspective, you'll think that any, everybody requires loans for a 1.75 lakh purchase. That is not true when you segment the se sorry, market like this. These are people who are kind of well-off. So that's the first thing. Second is just the nature of these installation. It's not like buying a TV that you bought on, on Flipkart and seven days later, the TV is working, right? There is a process of getting the government subsidy approved, net metering approved, putting the panels on your rooftop. Even in the best case scenario where let's say the distribution, the discom is really fast, it will take 60 to 90 days from the day you place an order for the system to get installed. So the homeowner is not paying all 100% on day one. They are getting a kind of a spread out payment where they pay, depending on different plans that they have, they'll pay 30 to 50% on day zero. And then the rest of the payment is somewhere during the course of these 60 to 90 days which is where the concept of an EMI starts to get lost in the customer's head. That even if you bring a scheme, which is six months or 12 months uh, spread out payments, it's not adding a lot of value. Another one, uh, and th these are the uh, customer related issues. One related issue that we saw was from the banks and the financial institution. Everybody thinks that they are We lost you. And I don't even need to take names. Right? If you check the, their home loan or a personal loan process, they would ask for property papers. Now imagine having a house in a Chhatarpur farmhouse, right? Or, or in, in a DLF farmhouse, uh, which were the adopters in 2016, 17 who bought our solar panel system. Now you are not going to give property papers of where property could be five crore or eight crore worth uh, to the bank for a two lakh rupee loan. So that's the kind of mismatch between what is what the banks understand the people are looking for. So they are not ready to change their ways for a sector which is still coming up. And they're not ready to understand that the underwriting of these homeowners will only benefit them because these are homeowners who, these are people who are well-off people. Uh, but the, 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 I think that's how every sector takes their own shape. Uh, while everyone from outside will keep thinking that loans and EMIs will win the game, uh, from the ground zero, we are not seeing that. Excellent point. In fact, I'm reminded that this uh, financial restructuring of the industry started when the aeroplane industry came. When the aeroplane industry came, they very soon realized that the airlines don't have the money to buy our aeroplanes because only when they will run it, uh, that then they will make profits. So they don't have money right now. Yeah. So they, they, they aligned with the banking industry and financing industry to make sure that their equipment could be leased or some kind of a financial arrangement could be made, which was long term. After that, some industries which followed this path did succeed, like the medical device industry, medical equipment industry, big MRIs, etc. coming up. Mm -hmm. However, all industries don't go the same way. And you bring a beautiful point which nuances this sector, where it also becomes clear that not only is the profile of the man who has already bought all these things is perhaps out of the circumference of that net which will catch an EMI uh, customer. You know, he doesn't need it. And secondly, if you ask him to give you his property papers uh, to, uh, to put up a two lakh installation on his uh, this uh, on, on his rooftop and thirdly the other day he was also telling that this is an installation which if it has to come out it almost comes out with the ceiling <laughs> <laughs> there is no way to recover no <laughs> yeah. you're absolutely right so derek we would like to know from you the ai piece you spoke about the iot piece now tell us about the ai piece how that is working uh, uh, and how that is innovating to enhance renewable energy adoption or use. Derek. Sure, sure. So I, I think the fundamental, AI is the holy grail. I think the basic fundamental building block is to have eyes over all your equipment and behaviors of interest. Uh, so it could be asset behavior, it could be consumer behavior, uh, as well as all of those events are instrumented and you remember them. So it's like the brain. You need to have memory to collect what happened to your asset, what 
behavior that your customer exhibit before you start learning. So I think the fundamental building block is to build a central brain of all these events, of things which happen to your equipment and behavior. So that, and that's a, what I would call a um, solar 360 data lake or an equipment 360 data lake, where you pour everything you know, and uh, even solar uh, 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 irradiance information, ambient temperature. So anything you want to capture, you just, it's kind of the other of solar, <laughs> you know, bring everything in, you know. And once that layer is fundamentally built, the second thing could be, uh, no, nothing as complex. Just find out what are the behaviors of interest? What is the average behavior, right? Average consumption behavior by industry, by time of the day. And what deviations do you observe from uh, expected behaviors? Basic anomaly detection can be built. And then you build your prediction models. And finally, I think every equipment at the end of the day will move towards self-heating systems. Uh, it's a function of how quickly the sensor costs come down and how quickly can you do uh, innovation on the edge itself? For example, today AI requires a lot of in, uh, investment in cloud infrastructure. I think there's innovation happening where, without in a ruggedized environment where you're operating under, let's say, desert-like condition, you can have edge intelligence which can quickly understand the signatures of failure and start self-feeding. So I think a combination of edge and a lot of anomaly detection over a period of time will propel many of these assets. Uh, towards self-healing system, and that's something to actually keep up. So almost follow the um, journey of a car. If you look at the journey of a car, uh, earlier it was an electromechanical asset. After some time, it became a little digital, and today it's gone all the way up to becoming self-driving cars. So I think every asset in the power industry will follow the journey of a Tesla, where it starts with the electromechanical uh, asset and over a period of time becomes self-healing. And uh, this is the uh, journey we are seeing, actually. Yeah, we 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 have we have an uh, uh, electric vehicle uh, stream also, and uh, one of our colleagues from uh, an automotive industry was saying that the electronics are eating up the car. You know? so it is becoming more and more an appliance. Absolutely. Coming coming to Pinaki, and let me start uh, taking some of the questions at least. I've had many questions and very intelligent and informed questions. Uh, how to approach asset heavy, heavy innovations other than the infrastructure investment fund you spoke of? How to approach asset heavy innovations? This is uh, Gurpreet Walia from Green Ops uh, Private Limited who is the co-founder asking this question. Pinaki. Okay. So, and uh, just before I answer the question, just uh, sort of uh, add on comment to what Derek said. Actually, so in the power systems, actually, the instrumentation control engineering was there right from the inception, actually, the SCADA systems and all. So, what is happening now is that with your uh, cost of sensors coming down, and uh, I mean, we are reclassifying re and calling it Internet of Things essentially, but it is basically just conventional SCADA and information control. But what would be really interesting is that uh, gathering all the data and being able to do predictive uh, sort of uh, problem solutions so that we can actually do preemptive action before something goes down again. Because you need a physical inter inter intervention, but the AI piece becomes sharp enough to say that, okay, by next, this thing or the trends, this is going to sort of go off like in the next yeah. two or three days. Okay. That is something really will be uh, really that's something that the SCADA doesn't predict. The yeah, AI yeah. can take you to the next level, and that will be something that we are really hopeful for it. It sort of leads to that that level essentially. Uh, just just wanted to add a point there in terms of practical. Uh, Absolutely makes sense. Uh, so as far as the asset uh, sort of uh, the sort of intent like capital intensive asset innovations are concerned. So the best way to do it is that, I mean, we saw it in the solar industry, which is a very expensive asset. We saw it in the wind industry, again, a very expensive asset, and now the storage also, energy storage. So basically, uh, the model is, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the CapEx model kind of doesn't work initially, because I have we do not find customers uh, unless they're government customers. One, you know, one possibility is that the government comes out with a scheme that they will do capex uh, bids initially for things that are not completely like commercially uh, viable today. For example, they come out with a large gigawatt scale storage tender. 
that the, like an NTPC will pay for the system, you will have to install the system. So the role in that case for a company is become becomes more of an EPC or a or a technology deployer. Okay, so in which you you deploy capital and get it out of it because somebody else owns it and usually the government owns it. Second, I have seen certain cases like in our commercial industrial customers, progressive customers, they might want to own a system like a energy storage system or something, which is something that is otherwise we would have spent a lot of money. They own it and then essentially we do the EPC model. But then for large scale deployment, essentially the, 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 the model is basically uh, getting a customer to buy the energy attributes, whether it's a saving or it's a energy supply that we are giving and ensuring that it becomes bankable, which means that you can at least get a reasonable amount of debt, at least a 70% debt, because you have somebody who's going to buy the energy for at least the next 10 years. So with that, that you lock in, essentially you can go to the bank and say that, okay, I will put in 30%. This person will put in seventy uh, percent. Okay. Second, further uh, uh, important like thing is that sometimes the customers are willing to put in some equity into the project itself to try out a new technology because they get a saving out of it. So if you have thirty percent of the cost as equity, they say suppose I'll put let's say uh, half of it. So it's just fifteen percent cost. It could be on twenty six percent, which is in certain cases regulations it requires some capital solar plants. So then essentially they spend only seven to eight percent of the entire capital cost, but they get a taste of that new innovation. And once they get a taste of the new innovation, next time onwards, we can go to the lender and say that, okay, we want 75% debt because technology works, right? So these are the things. And the other thing, the government also has played a positive role in case of solar and other cases where they gave certain, let's say, uh, some subsidies, they gave capital subsidies essentially to make it financially viable. When it was not financially viable, government gave capital subsidies. So the government, the buyer of power and the asset owner, for example, we are the asset owner and we are supplying the electricity. It, may, it creates a solution for all three of us. The government is giving the subsidy because it thinks that if I give the subsidy, the cost, the adoption will increase, cost will come down and it will solve uh, one of my problems. And the government's problem was that we don't have enough coal and gas and we have to go green. So they had to do this. The, how these are interrelated and basically the OPEX model can solve the problem in short, mm. any capital intensive uh, innovation. No, very, 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 very useful points. And also this point regarding that the government should consider giving subsidies is very valid because it has given a lot of subsidies to fossil fuel all over the world. Yeah. And uh, it is not only direct subsidy, but also indirect subsidy of providing the security, providing the pipelines for travel of fuel from one, 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 one country to another. So uh, great points. Uh, coming to uh, Pranesh, and after that, I will come back to you, uh, uh, back to you, uh, Pinaki. There is a question from Umang uh, on, on, the, on the chat, question and answer. Uh, Umang is from Rockefeller uh, uh, Foundation. And uh, please uh, look at that question because I would like both Pranesh and you to answer that question. Uh, before you go to that, uh, Pranesh, mm -hmm. what does the what are the innovation in solar panel recycling techniques? Okay. This question is coming from Jay Jaydeep Malviya, who is managing director, Malviya Solar Energy. And so, what are the innovations in solar panel recycling techniques? And then the second question is that, uh, which is from Umang, I'm taking, giving you this generic part. Umang says that the large CNI customers and large solar customers are surely there, but the smaller ones are sitting ducks for you. They are paying 15 to 20 rupees per watt because they are charging it through, uh, they, they are getting their electricity through diesel, etc. What has been your experience dealing with uh, the smaller customers, any contrarian views? And then I'll go back to Pinaki on this uh, because he's also asking some other points if AMP is, uh, uh, is involved in. Pranesh. 
Sure. So, so first point, uh, first question that you had, Pavan, was uh, more around the recycling one, right? So there are two, again, two ways of innovating in there. One could be on the material science perspective, right? How do you actually recycle the solar panels? Uh, not an expert on that. I wouldn't really be able to comment on what the exact scientific process of that is, because I think uh, it should be fairly standard, given how recycling has happened for all other uh, products in the past as well. This That could be figured out with glass or cells. How do you recycle that? Is the business innovation piece. And this is something which came to us about two and a half, three years ago, suddenly in one of our brainstorming sessions. And we started using it. That And, and we know that these are very early days. Uh, only uh, first-hand panels are not have not been sold in big numbers. How do you create a second-hand market for a second-hand product? But at, it has to, it is bound to happen. The way when cars first-hand cars are bought a lot, that's when it's followed by the second-hand car market. The similar thing is bound to happen on the solar panel side. So where all the bigger installers, when I say bigger installers, let's say an Amp or a Clean Max or a Renew, or, or companies from let's say Germany or a US or Australia who have been doing solar panel installations last, let's say for 20 years, there, there will come a time when, they are, when the system's ROI has been achieved, now they want to actually dispose of the panels or want a buyer downstream. Now, because it's going to be a bit, lot of ecological waste that people are going to be really concerned about, at least in the developed world. And then people would want some, uh, some residual money to come from it. That is where people who own the distribution downstream, and I say downstream, which will be the answer to Umang's question, uh, is bringing solar systems for homes, not just in the Gurgaons or the Bangalores, but also in the South 24 Parganas and the Kharagpurs and the Bhubaneshwars as well, where people are looking for a 50 watt system or a 165 watt panel only, which can just charge their mobile phone. That is where if if done, I, if, if, with whatever price is done, let's say if you are somebody is buying panels at uh, 18 rupees or 17 rupees per watt, if you recycle, if you are buying this now, which is a 20 year old system with a big firm, which had this uh, system whose money has been recovered or ROI has been recovered, I think it could be at a throwaway price. It could be at two rupees per watt or a three rupee per watt. You take that, you recycle it with whatever right industry practices could be there, you recycle it, and then use your distribution to sell these panels to the homeowner in a Patna or a Bhubaneswar, because you as a company know that this solar panels in year one, they had uh, X output. In year seven also, they have Y output left. And even in year 15, they have pretty, pretty decent output left. So how do you now utilize it? You, you break the system into smaller parts, smaller chunks, and then use your distribution. So like one of the questions that we, or one of the th thoughts we always have had in our uh, team is that if solar panels had a slightly lesser life, homeowners would have loved it. Nobody wants a 25 year, nobody has seen 25 years, right? So 25 years becomes a very long cycle to imagine. If it was, let's say, if somehow the silicon panels were only half the life and maybe two thirds the cost, homeowners would like it much more. So the same thing, this, this will be achieved when the recycling part starts to happen, which is not far off. We have started pitching it to all financial institutions that we are talking to. That if you finance our homeowner or our small factory owner through Zanru, and if you want it to be bought back in year five or year 10, we'll, we'll buy it back from you. It will, it will not be an easy thing for a bigger company, which is only doing in, dealing industrial clients to buy that back. But for somebody whose bread and butter is homes and smaller systems in the villages of India, which Zunroof and Zun Solar are, it, it would be a perfect mix, a perfect match for us. So we, we I, I think Indian ecosystem is slightly behind right now. Uh, probably the Western world is already there. Uh, but may, maybe a couple of years, these things get accelerated a lot. There's a lot of demand for, solar, to, to answer Umang's part, right? There's a lot of demand for solar panels and batteries, which we missed in the first three years. We, we thought that is the urban cities that we should be focusing on. Uh, but when we started our solar product brand about 18 months ago and put it out in small videos on YouTube and Facebook for people to consume, oh, it's voracious. The, the states like West Bengal, Odisha, uh, Kerala, the, the requirement with so much power outage, as he mentioned in his question himself, people are paying 15 to 20 rupees per unit there uh, just to charge their mobile phone or run a fan, which is where these solar panels are required while they, they are really going for it. If the recycling thing happens successfully, which it will, I have no doubt about it, it will happen successfully in a couple of years time from now, it will really, really open the floodgates. Okay. And I'll now come to you with the last question, but before that, I'll go to Pinaki. And the last question is from Ranar Patel, who is the CTO of Eco Impulse. What are your thoughts on solar cleaning robots, which are currently in the solar market? But before that, to Pinaki, to add to what Pranesh has said and what um, uh, what Umang has asked, Pinaki. Okay. 
so two aspects are there one is that uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the residential customers also in hinterlands and all uh, not getting access because of uh, one is the ability of the roof space and the commercial viability because of the so the cost of the panels and all there is a model called the uh, community solar farms that we do in us in which basically uh, you put up a solar power plant okay utility scale power plant megawatt scale in which uh, let's say suppose we put it up we will sell 50% of the power to the industries 50% of the power we sell directly to the consumers okay so what they do is that they will get a net off from their electricity bill so it's virtually they are buying green electricity okay without actually installing something on their roof and that way they get the savings in the, they take, uh, indirectly are making money from the sun without putting anything on their roof so that is an innovative model which can actually increase the adoption of individuals in participating in this uh, uh, like adoption of renewable energy which is a financial viable thing also so you don't need to get uh, you get away with all those things so that's a that's something at the intersection of what uh, like financial companies doing or what our company is doing so we are not in the b2c space but this is a intersection between this is a very innovative thing that can be practiced in india that can do the individual sort of participation uh, of the uh, the uh, other cities because uh, the tier 2 tier 3 cities whatever they are they have good resources in that state essentially so we can install the megawatt megawatt scale power plants the second thing the issue is that suppose now we were to sell up uh, create an uh, 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 a megawatt scale power plant just selling to the smaller sector companies the cni customers or the large ones let's say the uh, medium msme sector you now main issue becomes is that because uh, if they want a capex solution we have no issue okay we will do that because there is no credit risk that we have suppose they want a 5 megawatt system we'll create a 5 megawatt power plant within the uh, complex and we'll do it okay issue becomes when we have to own the system and sell them electricity in the long term so in that case what happens is that there is a credit uh, support the, the, the credit uh, rating is very important if the credit rating is not uh, of investment grade then the bank financing doesn't come in at least 70% if the bank financing come in comes in that reduces the cost of the power that is delivered to the customer and increases the savings so if it if its rating is low the bank debt reduces the so the electricity cost increases the savings drop so the viability is sort of that's how it is correlated so they are essentially to ensure that this thing happens uh, what we need is credit enhancement so if companies like uh, if, uh, like foundations like rockefeller foundation and uh, institutions like that who are uh, i would say uh, venture philanthropist kind of institutions they can actually give it a credit uh, sort of support that is one is that okay you will take long term credit uh, backup let's say one year payment in advance or something like that but a third layer like a institution like rockefeller can come and solve that problem by giving a credit support to that very customer so which may or may not get used essentially but that gives bankability reduces the price and reduces increases the savings so that can be the solution there so i'm glad i'm glad glad you say that Yeah. because we are that means we are it's not only the audience which are uh, raising questions we are also in uh, raising invocations to the audience to come forward i am asking them to solve the problem that they are actually asking also which is this is sort of what i am trying to say here and they have a role to play because i have been in that space in the impact investment space i have been there so there is a lot of way that because they have a triple bottom line benefit also because they are actually reducing the deployment of use of diesel and those kind of things and helping the msme sector which is in the hinterlands to grow and because if they have the lower cost power their profitability improves their compete their competitive like their competitiveness with respect to the mainstream companies increases so they can grow so it's it's a win win solution and just before i end the last thing on the robotic engineering robotic engineering is very important for large scale power plants because most of the cases the large uh, resources are in places like rajasthan and other places and all uh, which do not have a lot of water resources and there is a huge difference when you don't clean the panels in terms of the generation so it goes without saying that you have to keep the panels spick and span so the maximum generation otherwise all those millions of uh, rupees that we spend goes down the drain okay so so uh, large scale uh, robotic cleaning systems is completely a 
base standard for most of the larger projects because you don't have enough water there also. And uh, and that creates continuous cleaning and it doesn't destroy the panel life. There are warranties that are there in place. It's not something that will like, peel off the surface and all. It's not that bad. But it's it's central to the way that we are uh, sort of designing the plants going forward as of today. We have to save the water also. We cannot keep on wasting water there also. So, so on that good. note, let me let me ask you one last question uh, from Sudhyant Sudhyant Manu, CEO Greenet Technologies. Sure. How does the net metering policy affect the adoption of renewable energy in the commercial industrial sector? Uh, the short answer is it impacts it positively. So impact is positive, zero or negative. It's a positive impact. Uh, what happens is that essentially, uh, uh, suppose I install, let's say, a uh, 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 sort of power plant within the factory. Okay, now uh, issue is that sometimes he has situations where his uh, plant is on a maintenance, he's not using the power, it's a holiday, or it's the shift is not there, but we are regenerating electricity. So if uh, using the same asset that is within his factory, it is uh, sort of through net metering, it is uh, sort of uh, put into the grid. It's something that is that is a good thing to happen, essentially. Yeah. So Great. in fear of the maximum utilization of the asset, nothing is wasted and everything is paid for. Great. Pranesh, any other point you'd like to add or uh, should we uh, close this uh, uh, session, Pranesh? Just, just one line on the robotic cleaning one. Yeah, so I, and Pinaki really summed it up really well. This is really important for the large scale ones. For, and, but I see a lot of people uh, or entrepreneurs trying out this for the home segment as well. I speaking from the home side, I don't think it's required, honestly. And I could be proven totally wrong in five years time. That's the nature of the devil of B2C space. You make proclamations and get proven wrong all the time. Uh, but the fact is in, in India, the cost of labor is really, really uh, low. And the homeowners that we are talking about who have home, who have a car, your car cleaning gets done in Gurgaon for 300 rupees uh, and the entire month somebody comes and cleans your car. Uh, so it's, it's it, nobody is going to pay for the robot right now, at least in the home segment. You just need to nudge the homeowner because as Pinagi was saying, right, they have invested those million, not millions, but they've invested some lakhs of rupees in the system. They need to be nudged toward killing it themselves. They have a house help or they can go themselves. If they like their solar panels, it looks really speak and span. It will produce the output for them. Plus the nudging by comparing them to their neighbors and stuff is, is the only thing required. Robots will be a uh, overfit right now. You have to think of the financial viability at all times when, when you're making any innovation. Excellent, excellent addition. And uh, we are we are well uh, beyond our time. Thank you very much panelists and thank you very much. The questions which were asked really focused on the uh, our, our topic. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Tribhuvan Singh Kathaya. Uh, and other than the people who I mentioned, Nikhil Garg, uh, Kamlesh Singh Tanwar, uh, Lakka Raju Pundarik, Akshat Vyas. I hope we have answered all the questions. Whatever is not answered, feel free to reach out to the uh, to Blue Circle through their app, and uh, you will get not only uh, uh, the answers from the, the panelists. We'll try to get those for you, but also from leading experts from all over the world uh, who you can engage with. Uh, on that note. Uh, let me thank you all as well as the informed audience and pass it on to Siddharth. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, such an insightful and engaging conversation and a, and a real privilege to hear you all. Uh, our leaders and I have taken home several nuggets from today's conversation. I'm also receiving messages from our webinars as we speak. Uh, I really wish we had more time. Uh, so thank you uh, to our leaders in the audience as well for always joining in and till the end and for always sharing excellent questions. Um, uh, as, as Mr. Chaudhary has mentioned, uh, for the questions that have not been addressed due to paucity of time, I will share the relevant ones with the leaders on the panel and request some of their time for it. We will also try to post the answers in the community app as well. So along with our weekly webinars and our publication, we're taking these discussions and conversations on the exclusive community app, which is curated for sector leaders across six sectors, which are energy, logistics, healthcare, e-mobility, real estate, aerospace, and defense. So whether you would like to engage with us on our platform, leaders are invited to join the energy circle and also get access to the other allied circles which we have introduced. Uh, I've also shared the app link and we will be emailing the leaders in the audience shortly. So thank you very much, sirs, once again. We look forward to having more such discussions in the future and please stay safe. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. bye.